Testing. Testing. Okay. Ready to roll? <clears throat> okay. All right, folks. So I think we'll um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, thank you all for for coming out tonight on this this very dramatic looking Boston Common and, and background to uh, to us here um, on the on the Freedom Trail. Thank you, of course, for everybody tuning in tonight on on the various forums. Uh, my name is Robert Chimp. I'm the Research and Adult Program Director for the Paul Revere uh, Memorial Association. Um, it's great to be with you here tonight on what is the, the final leg of this uh, three-part uh, series this year. Um, as uh, we're looking at areas um, and topics um, in the American Revolution, revolutionary era broadly construed that go certainly far uh, beyond, in some cases, the traditional narratives around the, the 13 colonies turned, uh, turned states. Um, tonight's talk, of course, follows on our previous two lectures from Professor Janet Pulaski looking at uh, revolutionary uh, rights, um, both in America, across Europe, uh, Caribbean as well, and of course, uh, Tessa Murphy looking at uh, the revolutionary period um, uh, and the war specifically uh, in, the, in the Caribbean last time out. Um, those uh, continue, and we'll, I'll reference this again at the end, those continue to live live on uh, the forum network as well and on our various platforms. So feel free to, of course, uh, keep getting those cl clicks up. Uh, give, give them a look after the fact as well. Um, uh, before I get started, I'd also, of course, like to thank the Lowell Institute uh, for making our program uh, possible through various generous funding. Uh, of course, our partners in GBH and the broadcasting arm, Frederick and Andrew, uh, in the back running the show there. Uh, and of course, uh, Suffolk University, the History Department, Katie Lasdow, for, for giving us this wonderful space here uh, right on uh, Boston Common. Uh, for questions in the chat afterwards, uh, for folks in person, I'll try to pass the mic around so we catch your audio. So feel free to um, you know, raise your hand. We'll, we'll get your questions there. If you're watching online, uh, toss them in the chat. We're monitoring uh, the feed. Hi, Emily. Uh, let me know on, on questions uh, as we're going through. And we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can on the time that, that we have here. So for tonight's lecture, we are uh, extremely excited to welcome uh, Dr. Elise Mitchell, who will talk on slavery and smallpox inoculation, of course, a, a still very uh, a, a topical uh, lecture here um, for us in our, our modern day. Um, Dr. Mitchell is a historian of uh, the early modern Black Atlantic and currently a presidential postdoctoral research fellow in the history department at Princeton University. Broadly, her work examines the social and cultural histories of slavery, the body, medicine, and healing, disease, race, and gender in the early modern Atlantic world. She's currently working on a book about enslaved Africans who contended with smallpox epidemics, municipal health regulations, and compulsory medical treatments during and after their transatlantic journeys to the Caribbean region. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is also developing a digital history project based on her research database of over 300 smallpox outbreaks. Really looking forward, of course, to, to that coming out and, and, and the book. Um, Dr. Mitchell's publications include a chapter in the edited volume, uh, Medicine and Healing in the Age of Slavery, a recently published article, check it out, in the William & Mary Quarterly, uh, congrats on that, and a forthcoming article in the Journal of the Early Republic. Her essays have appeared in The Atlantic and has co-authored uh, publications about the history of race and medicine. Uh, Dr. Mitchell completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania and earned her PhD at New York University. She's received fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, Huntington Library, and the McNeil Center for Early American Studies. So if you would, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell. Thank you for that introduction, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to talk a lot about smallpox and slavery during this presentation, and I sincerely hope I don't lose any of you along the way. But if I do, I hope to get you back during the question and answer period. I always like to begin with a bit of a story. In 1721, as, a deadly, as deadly smallpox epidemics raged in New England, West Africa, Western Europe, and the Caribbean, a West African man here in Boston remembered how outbreaks unfolded in his homeland. He remembered his own country was a place where smallpox inoculation arrested epidemics and enabled brave young men to travel and trade hundreds of miles away. In this context, smallpox inoculation involved deliberately infecting a person with the disease to control how, when, and to whom it spread. 
The practice was widely used in West Africa by the 18th century, and although there is no evidence suggesting that it was used in West Central Africa. The West African man spoke of these things and more to the Puritan minister, Benjamin Coleman, who referred to him as an anonymous, quote, poor Negro. Coleman wrote the following. He told me that he lived in a great town in his own country, and when smallpox came into it, they did what they could to prevent the spreading of it, that the families that were first visited usually died among them, but when the sickness got into five or six houses, so that the people began to despair of being able to stop it, then all who had not had it went presently and received it in the way of inoculation, as we call it. And that not one more died of it through the whole town. A whole place takes it in a week and are well in a week. Sometimes when young men among them wanted to go a trading two or 300 miles off, but were afraid because they had not yet had the smallpox, it was common for them to inquire where it was and go to the place and be inoculated and then go and trade anywhere without fear. Perhaps the poor Negro who spoke to Coleman was once a young man who sought inoculation as a means of freer mobility. The man's references to large urban centers and trade routes that reached two and 300 miles off allude to the urban centers and trading networks that characterized West Africa. Young people would have been the most vulnerable to smallpox and therefore ideal candidates for smallpox inoculation, having not been alive long enough to contract it otherwise. The unnamed man's description also suggests that his community combined smallpox inoculation with other healing techniques when they, quote, did what they could to prevent the spreading of it. Perhaps they combined rituals, quarantines, or other public healing practices and only relied on inoculation if other methods failed. Nevertheless, it was up to the community to determine when it was appropriate for their children or peers to receive inoculation and there were also the young men who sought out smallpox outbreaks in pursuit of preventative inoculations. A young man's ability to seek inoculation was contingent upon his uninhibited mobility. Once inoculated, these men's worlds expanded. They could travel without fear to establish commercial, social, political, and spiritual networks far beyond their homes. For West Africans, inoculation was about much more than merely surviving smallpox. Inoculation enabled a community's freedom from disease, freedom of movement, and freedom from fear. Historians often overlook Coleman's account in favor of one by Cotton Mather, in which a man he enslaved and called Anesmith um, told him about the inoculation procedures used in West Africa, but very little about their social and cultural significance. Mather and an and Anesmus's exchange has been studied extensively by historians examining Europeans' opinions of African medical knowledge. Indeed, since the 18th century, generations of scholars have been surprised that Africans possess knowledge of inoculation. But it is time we set aside shock and awe to consider the historical significance of the procedure for Africans and how slavery transformed the practice and its attendant social meanings. Grappling with the African Atlantic history of smallpox inoculation on its own terms requires setting aside the liberal impulse to simply acknowledge that Africans knew about inoculation in order to weave their histories into global narratives of medical history. Instead, questions of how the social and cultural significance of inoculation changed in different contexts must take center stage. As the 18th century elapsed, inoculation would come to mean something radically different for enslaved Africans in the Americas than it did in West Africa. News of smallpox inoculation reached Western Europe by way of Turkey and North Africa in the 1710s. Within a decade, enslaved Africans in Massachusetts had informed Cotton Mather and other Puritan ministers and physicians of their familiarity with the practice and how to perform it. By the 1720s, the Royal African Company began performing compulsory smallpox inoculations on enslaved Africans before shipping them across the Atlantic, effectively transforming what was once a West African practice designed to preserve kin and community into a tool to facilitate tearing those very communities apart. Though enslaved Africans continued to perform smallpox inoculations among themselves in the Americas, as the 18th century waned, slave owners and slave traders increasingly employed European physicians and surgeons to perform compulsory smallpox inoculations on the enslaved to foster more profitable slave trade and prevent economic losses and labor shortages on plantations. Nevertheless, even when they found themselves in the hands of Europeans, enslaved Africans who recalled how inoculation was practiced in their homelands contested and negotiated the inoculation strategies that Europeans used. 
Their continued practice and methods of contesting European inoculators reveal how enslaved Africans continue to use inoculation as a method of healing, but also a method of embodied kin making and social cohesion amid the alienating realities of enslavement in the Atlantic world. In the 18th century, Puritan clergymen, as well as leading French and English physicians, Hans Sloan, Codwallader Colden, and Charles-Marie de la Condamine, presented and published evidence of enslaved Africans' extensive knowledge of smallpox inoculation for the public and leading European physicians at the Royal Society of London and in the Académie Royale de Séance in Paris. Their accounts circulated in the Caribbean region across French, British, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, and Danish boundaries in pamphlets, letters, treatises, and newspapers. Countless French and English authors attested to sub-Saharan Africans' knowledge of inoculation, claiming that the practice, quote, predated the introduction of Mohammedanism or Islam, and also had been in use since Temp Immemorial. Their work was designed to promote inoculation as a universal good, knowledge so vital and comprehensible that even Africans engaged in the practice. However, enslaved Africans constructed their own histories of the practice. Their collective historical memory enabled enslaved Africans to reconstitute their communities in the Americas. Glimpses of this history made their way into the archival record when enslaved Africans in early 18th century Boston related their collective history of smallpox inoculation to Cotton Mather. Mather recorded, I have since met with a considerable number of these Africans who all agree in one story, that in their country, grandy many die of the smallpox, but now they learn this way. People take the juice of smallpox and cutty the skin and put in a drop and then bite and buy a little sicky sicky, then very few little things like smallpox and nobody die of it and nobody have smallpox anymore. Setting aside the racialist motivations of Mather's clumsy rendering of African pidgin English, this passage recalls this community's medical history, one story in which they could all agree. Their construction of a common history and shared past was integrated with their deliberate construction of physical bodies who could not, quote, have smallpox anymore. They recalled an understanding of health that was not based on the distinction between the bodies of the sick and well, but the strength of the protective social and physical body of the collective. For these Africans, physical health and social relations could not be disaggregated. By drawing on their shared experiences of smallpox inoculation, they constructed a usable past that affirmed their natal connection as a people and a common geopolitical ties to, quote, country. In the context of slavery, Africans recreated and reformed their ethnic, cultural, and social identities in ways that did not necessarily reflect the demographic diversity or ethnic divisions in West Africa. For enslaved Africans in early 18th century Boston, ethnogenesis included the construction of a common medical history that recalled a life-saving practice. This was essential for their individual and communal survival amid the precarious conditions of European colonization and enslavement. As I said before, Mather first heard about the smallpox inoculation from a man he enslaved in his home and called Onesimus. Mather identified him as Garamantes in his first letter to the Royal Society. His subsequent letters referenced an army of Africans who were inoculated while they were yet in Barbary. The terms Garamantes and Barbary allude to the complexities of pre-colonial West African history and remain open to multiple interpretations. Some historians have imbued Mather's references with modern significance, interpreting Garamantes to mean people in present-day southern, southern Liberia and southern Libya, excuse me, and Barbary to mean the Barbary coast. Others believe that is a reference to Garamanch, present day in present-day Burkina Faso. Other historians have suggested that Garamantes was one of many early English orthographies for Coromanti, a term used by Europeans to refer to Akan, Tui, and Gebe-speaking West Africans from the Gold Coast region. It is quite likely that many of the enslaved Africans in Boston during the early 18th century hailed from the Gold Coast and may have identified themselves as Coromanti. However, Mather's geographic and ethnographic reference might actually recall a much earlier history. It seems plausible that these were references to African antiquity, the temp immemorial and the time before Mohammedanism that Africans referenced in other sources suggest as much. We might imagine that Mather's curiosity led him to prod Anesmus for more or historical details. Perhaps they consulted his library of historical references together. After all, he did make him read every night. 
the early modern dictionaries, travel narratives, and ancient and medieval histories of Africa that Mather would have had access to use the term Garamant or Garamantese as, ambiguous as an ambiguous reference to all of the people who lived south of Libya, who were, quote, in old time, the farthest people southward. In his recent study of medieval West Africa, Michael Gomez underscores the significance of migration and surviving West African oral traditions and classical sources from this period. He explains that before the advent of Islam in the Maghrib in the seventh century, the Garamants controlled trade between the Mediterranean and West Africa. These oral traditions would have been part of some 18th century West Africans' historical memories. By the 15th century, some European chroniclers conflated the Garamants with Ethiopians and used these terms as general ambiguous references to sub-Saharan Africans. With this in mind, when they were yet in Barbary also appears to be a curious phrase. It is unlikely that enslaved Africans in Boston were trafficked from North Africa in the 18th century. However, they may have had some North African ancestry. Roughly a century before these enslaved Africans crossed the Atlantic in 1591, Three to 4,000 North African and Iberian troops invaded Songhai, destroying the empire and ushering in a century of disarray. Many of these troops remained in the region as new smaller states formed after the empire's demise. Continued regional instability and warfare left many of them vulnerable to capture and traffic in the transatlantic slave trade. Thus, it is possible that some enslaved West Africans in Boston claim genealogical or cultural ancestral ties to North African troops who may have practiced inoculation when they were yet in Barbary. Mather's use of yet also echoes his other correspondence and publications in which he used the adverb to emphasize the deep past, including references to antiquity, biblical times, or prelapsarian times. Perhaps this indicated a deep past, the seventh century, or Songhai's fall into disarray when disease and famine claimed numerous lives. 17th and 18th century Englishmen also used Barbary as shorthand for barbarity or a barbarous state. In his published writing, Mather used barbarity to reference Africa as a whole. The ambiguity of terms like Garamantes and Barbary indicate the challenges that enslaved Africans faced when trying to communicate their histories to European slave owners who had limited, if any, knowledge of the continent's political history and geography. Decades later, during a smallpox outbreak in New York, Codwallader Colgan overheard his enslaved Africans mention that they too were familiar with smallpox inoculation in their country, where, quote, seldom any old people had the disease. These enslaved people were likely peers or only slightly younger than the enslaved people Mather spoke to. Colden wrote, quote, by making a small cut in the arm and applying a little cotton dipped in variolous pus, they only, they only abstain from all flesh meat and drink plentifully of water assiduated with the juice of limes, which grow large and plentiful in their country. In addition to striking similarities between their techniques and those described by enslaved Africans in Boston, their reference to Lyme suggests that these people were either from the Gold Coast or the Slave Coast. Colden appreciated the depth of their history and speculated, quote, it seems probable that the practice is much older than the Turkish practice and that it came from Africa originally with the distemper itself. While enslaved Africans in the Americas were sharing their knowledge of inoculation, Western Europeans were already appropriating the practice along the West African coast to facilitate the growth of the slave trade. In 1722, Mather reported, quote, it is no unusual thing for ships on the coast of Guinea when they ship their slaves to find out by inquiry which slaves have not yet had the smallpox and so carry them ashore in this way to give it to them that the poor creatures may sell for a better price. Enslaved West Africans who were familiar with smallpox inoculation would have recognized the transformation from a practice that once enabled and increased their community's freedom into one that facilitated their enslavement. However, the practice of carrying enslaved people ashore to perform smallpox inoculations or any other medical treatments proved inefficient in the eyes of some Royal Africa Company factors. One Royal African Company factory surgeon and inoculator, James Houston, recalled that a factor, Peter Baldwin, challenged Houston's practice of bringing ill enslaved Africans ashore before departure. Despite Houston's pleas that, quote, stowing Negroes on board was the cause of much greater mortality, Baldwin insisted that he would rather, quote, have them die out of his custody, that there might be no farther inquiry made about them, for a dead slave was better in his pocket than a living one. The quote underscores the role of the surgeon in the slave trade, not as a healer, but a purveyor of which slaves were merchantable and the person charged with managing a profitable margin of suffering and death that would benefit the company's investments. 
Baldwin was far more concerned that enslaved people would die of diseases or, or from medical procedures under his custody than he was about enslaved Africans surviving a transatlantic voyage, much less the delicate public health situation in American ports. Tensions between Houston and Baldwin would eventually result in Houston's departure from the Royal Africa Company in the 1720s. What Houston could not do in West Africa, he continued to do in the Caribbean and South America. He quickly joined the South Sea Company in Cartagena as a surgeon. While there, he may have performed smallpox inoculations. In his memoir, he boasted that, quote, out of 4,000 Negroes in three years' time with smallpox and several other epidemical distempers amongst them, we have lost but 36. The Spaniards have likewise reaped the benefits of my profession. It is difficult to imagine that a British physician sent to West Africa under orders to, quote, put in practice smallpox inoculation for the Royal Africa Company would not have continued the practice for the South Sea Company's benefit in Cartagena. South Sea Company factory surgeons worked alongside proto medicos, local surgeons and doctors, including many of African and native descent, to treat enslaved African arrivals. Houston likely shared his knowledge of smallpox inoculation with these Spanish colonial practitioners who may have already been familiar with the practice by way of numerous West African healers in their midst. If Houston did perform inoculations on over 4,000 Negroes after their harrowing transatlantic and intra-Caribbean journeys, he would have performed far more inoculations than physicians of his time. Elsewhere in the Atlantic, European physicians rarely treated 4,000 individual cases of smallpox and fewer performed over 1,000 inoculations before the late 18th century. Houston and many other 18th century European inoculators depended upon the human geography of the slave trade, particularly uh, the human geography of slavery and particularly the slave trade to develop medical expertise. It is unclear how often smallpox inoculation was practiced along slave trading routes, Sporadic references to enslaved people inoculated on West African ships and shores appear in the archival record after Houston's departure. It appears that when smallpox broke out during transatlantic voyages, slave traders typically tried to arrest it by isolating infected enslaved people on the ship, or in some cases they rewarded to throwing enslaved people overboard before the disease spread. Inoculations during transatlantic voyages appear to have been rare. Others attempted to treat the disease to preserve their profit. However, in the early 18th century, English physicians interested in testing smallpox inoculation continued to exploit other nodes of the European slaving geography. An exploit they did. Over the next two decades, European medical practitioners flocked towards slavery, the slave trade, and black bodies to hone and ply their trades. As more Western European medical practitioners and learned societies endorsed inoculation in the second half of the 18th century, news of inoculation trials on enslaved people in the Caribbean circulated more widely. For example, in the 1770s, in a letter lauding the efforts of Juan Perdomo, a Canarian physician credited with popularizing inoculation in Caracas and Venezuela in the 1760s, this letter circulated in Spanish newspapers to promote inoculation in the metropole. The letter described the inoculation ensayos or tests that Perdomo performed on enslaved and free people before the governor, Jose Solano y Bote, granted permission for him to perform inoculations in Caracas. Part of the letter read, he performed the first test in nine children between four and nine years old, the second in 12 between nine and 18 years old, and, and that, that were presented by their parents or owners, and the third in 23 persons between 18 and 40, all turned out very well. Seeing these very successful inoculations, it was permitted in the province by the hand of that doctor, starting with four of my children. In effect, 5,000 people received inoculations. With this, I do not know of any deaths, except one senora who risked the operation hiding the illness she suffered, and Diana Ponte, who was inoculated clandestinely by a French surgeon. Although Caracanos were already aware of smallpox inoculation and presumably its efficacy, having learned it from at least one French surgeon and likely other clandestine practitioners, they insisted that Perdomo demonstrate his skills. Slave owners conscripted enslaved African children to serve as Perdomo's test subjects alongside free people whose families chose to have them inoculated. This type of testing was not unique. Spanish, French, British and Portuguese physicians also used enslaved Africans' bodies to prove themselves and the efficacy and safety of inoculation. These types of inoculation tests reinforced enslaved people's status as property and commodities. <laughs> 
After physicians, including the notorious inoculator John Quire, popularized smallpox inoculation during a harrowing epidemic in Jamaica in 1768, news of inoculation's efficacy spread like wildfire in the Caribbean. For example, one missionary traveling in the Danish West Indies during the late 1760s noted that their result had been the subject of discussion and enthusiasm among Danish Caribbean slave owners. The missionary wrote, the damage done to the planter's interests when the greater part of their slaves fall victim to this disease and die is such that it should have induced them long ago to block its injurious spread through the utilization of all possible precautions. In Jamaica, a very successful test has been run on the Negroes of that island by rubbing the crushed pox into their skin. The Europeans in the other islands should likewise be stimulated to employ this means in order to preserve the lives of many thousands of Negroes. This brief passage from Christian George Andreas Oldendorf's description of the Danish West Indies is representative of how Jamaican experiments were embraced and influenced practices on other islands. The passage also demonstrates that Europeans viewed inoculation as a tool that would, quote, benefit the planter's interests. Enslaved people's lives and quality of life only matter to slaveholders, colonial officials, and European inoculators insofar as it could economically benefit slave owners in the Caribbean. Furthermore, Oldendorp's reference to Europeans on other islands suggests that when it came to matters of economics and community health, Europeans were increasingly viewing themselves as a social group that exceeded imperial distinctions. To Oldendorp and many other inoculation proponents, this was a matter of pan-European and pan-Caribbean concern, not one defined by the geopolitical or cultural limits of empire. Positive references to mass inoculations in Jamaica also appeared in Saint-Domingue's advertiser, Le Affiche Americans, in June of 1769. It read, according to letters from Jamaica, inoculation has been introduced there some time ago and is making great progress every day. It is said that a habitant has inoculated nearly 3,000 Negroes there, only one of them which perish. Since smallpox often makes prodigious ravages among the Negroes in this island, as in all Antillean islands, it is expected that the success of this method will lower the price of slaves and thereby favor the progress of trade. At the time the notice was published, inoculation had only recently been accepted by Parisian medical elites and was slowly gaining popularity among large-scale slave owners in Saint-Domingue. The advertisement proposed that inoculation would help with price control in the slave market. The Seven Years' War had ostensibly altered the French had ostensibly halted the French Atlantic slave trade, and after the Treaty of Paris, 1763, despite their territorial losses in the Caribbean, the French slave trade resumed in greater numbers with higher prices. Some colonists believed that inoculation would prevent enslaved Africans' unexpected and untimely deaths, and could help bring down the price of enslaved Africans by decreasing local demands in Saint-Domingue, the wealthiest French Caribbean colony. The advertisement reintroduced Saint-Domingue's elite slave owners to the practice of inoculation as one that was performed by habitants on naif rather than one performed by Africans on each other. The slave owners and doctors who sought out and performed smallpox inoculations on the enslaved were not motivated by a humanitarian concern, they were motivated by profits and power. In addition to local concerns that enslaved Africans would communicate smallpox to others in Saint-Domingue, guaranteed reimbursement likely encouraged some slave owners and slave traders to inoculate enslaved people. For example, in 1769, advertisements from elite and middling English and French inoculators stationed near slaving ports peppered Saint-Domingue's newspaper. Gilbert de Lamotte, one of the first French physicians to perform smallpox inoculations in Saint-Domingue, built his career on the success of the inoculations he performed on enslaved Africans arriving from the coast of Africa. His advertisement, which explicitly targeted slave owners, appeared three months after the 1769 article about inoculations in Jamaica. Um, and an excerpt from Mott's advertisement included the following. He offers to inoculate with guarantee the subjects that we want to entrust to him. That is to say, he will reimburse the price of the estimate that will have been made before of, of, the, of the Negroes, who by a fate we cannot absolutely foresee would be the victims. He does not think he has to go into the details of the advantages which would remove from um, this, the country this scourge which stifles the workforce enough, either by killing many Negroes or by making them waste precious time while this cruel epidemic crosses the workers. 
The only guarantee of the goodness of this operation is the beneficial effects it provides in Europe where it is becoming increasingly recognized. And he ends by observing that the interest which gave rise to inoculation in Georgia and Circassia at the time at that this same interest in different respects must compel us to put inoculation in use in the colony. Mott viewed inoculation as a way of both of making both the slave trade and the institution of slavery more sustainable in the blooming sugar colony. And he wasn't the only French inoculator to offer guarantees. For example, Jean-Baptiste Leblonde, a French physician and naturalist who performed smallpox inoculations in French Guiana, Grenada, and Trinidad, also offered guarantees when he introduced inoculation to French Grenadian slaveholders in 1771. With more than 200 blacks thus successfully inoculated, or he wrote, with more than 200 blacks successfully inoculated, I inoculated a large number in the plantations where I was hired and elsewhere at the rate of 20 francs per head. But guaranteeing their life for the share of 1,000 francs, francs per individual, the risk I ran was only one in 50. So that if one had died, I would not have gained anything. And if two had perished, I would have lost 1,000 francs. Thus I inoculated more than 500 without losing a single one. LeBlanc was a plantation physician. Unlike many of the inoculators in Saint-Domingue, LeBlanc's practice was not in proximity to the, to the port. Nevertheless, commodification suffused the logic of his inoculations. The widespread use of guarantees for enslaved people who died during inoculations further underscores how Caribbean inoculation practices were increasingly predicated on the commodification of the enslaved. Thus, by the time that George Washington decided to mass inoculate his troops during the Revolutionary War in 1776 and 1777, mass inoculations of enslaved Africans were already popular throughout the Caribbean region. And though we cannot say with certainty, the mass testing and popularity of smallpox inoculation on enslaved Africans may have instilled widespread confidence in the practice on both sides of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, enslaved Africans who were familiar with its inoculation as a healing and kin-making strategy still found ways to adapt it to the realities of restricted communal agency and mobility and bondage. West Africans, like an unnamed African man who the French physician Charles Arthaud described as practicing inoculation in Saint-Domingue using the quote method practiced in its countries, um, I mean, is one of many examples of how enslaved Africans continued the practice in the Caribbean. It is tempting to imagine that these practices continued in the Americas as they were performed in West Africa, but the social, geographic, and by extension, spiritual and political conditions of enslavement would have transformed inoculation. The known sources about smallpox inoculation in the Caribbean do not provide enough details about the inoculation method to determine its technical transformations. Nevertheless, in the context of slavery and colonialism, the meanings that enslaved Africans ascribed to smallpox inoculation took on new significance. The French and English physicians who documented enslaved Africans' inoculation practices termed the practice buying the smallpox. Duchemin de Le Tang used the terms French equivalent, acheter le petit verrou, to describe enslaved African inoculators' practices in Saint-Domingue in his 1779 article titled Inoculation. He wrote, the African and the Asian have practiced it since Tampa Memorial. The Neg also recognize its usefulness, and amongst themselves they call it acheter le petit verrou, because as the one from whom it is taken sells it to whomever they give it to. This which is practiced very simply with a thorn of lemon that is soaked in, ripe, in a ripe pustule to prick into the one who wants to communicate it. Decades later, in the early 19th century, James Thompson in Jamaica described a similar practice. They term it buying the smallpox from the circumstances that the parent of the child from whom the matter is taken always expects a small remuneration from the person to whom the disease is communicated. Every practitioner knows that they transfer this notion to the cowpox, and the mothers are greatly offended if you neglect to give them some small gratuity after having received lymph or crust from the arm of the child. Enslaved Africans' use of lemon trees demonstrates how they adapted their inoculation practices to the materials available in the Caribbean context. It is unlikely that enslaved people traveled very far from their homes to seek inoculations on their own. Nevertheless, acts of petite marronage were common throughout the Caribbean, and enslaved people may have relied on local networks to seek inoculations. Both Letang and Thompson italicized the words acheter and buying in their descriptions. Perhaps this was an attempt to indicate otherness, difference, or foreignness of their vernaculars. 
The terms acheter and to buy may have obscured the cultural, spiritual, and ritual connotations associated with these financial exchanges. The terminology buying the smallpox and acheter le petit verreau show up in descriptions of invasive and non-invasive forms of smallpox inoculation practiced in Northern Africa, East Africa, and even rural parts of Western Europe. For example, early modern France, in early modern France, quote, country people inoculated their children by sending them to, quote, their neighbors to buy smallpox for a penny. European physicians may have introduced this familiar vernacular to describe African inoculation practices, collapsing their epistemological and ritual differences. In some parts of West Africa, it was customary for the families of those being treated to, for smallpox to make financial tributes to the deity affecting them by paying medical and spiritual practitioners. Thus, buying could encompass secular and non-secular commercial and metaphysical notions of payment and reception. African Atlantic vocabularies and concepts of payment, gratuity, tribute, exchange, and adulation can easily be subsumed under the English and French terms to buy and acheter. For example, in modern Haitian Creole, depending on the context, acheter takes on an adulatory connotation. In idioms such as acheter fengi, and the more vulgar ache deye translate to buying one's face or buying one's ass. However, both connote excessive flattery, fawning, bribery, cajoling, or currying favor. In other words, buying may, have, may be better interpreted as signifying to pay, which has financial connotations to pay a debt, adulatory connotations to pay homage or respect, and social connotations to pay a visit. To buy may have also signified to get or to receive. The notion of reception is also present in Akan healing epistemologies that emphasize that one's body must receive or accept medicine. In a similar vein, Melville Hertzkowitz's descriptions of Dahomean responses to smallpox deaths may be instructive. Hertzkowitz explains that it was customary for the family members of a victim of smallpox to negotiate with priests in order to repurchase or buy back the deceased soul. Leslie Desmangles has argued that this practice bears strong resemblance to Haitian voodoo reclamation rites. Now this semantic exercise that I just performed is not intended to collapse the diversity of West African or Afro-diasporic medical, medical healing and spiritual traditions. Rather what I'm trying to do is trouble the ontological basis of these exchanges to bring into relief the possible rituals, praxis, and realities that exist within the pregnant silences in the archive. In other words, the potential connections between these disparate yet related practices and articulations of tabai in the context of smallpox and healing both complicate and clarify the meanings of buying the smallpox. Inconclusive as my analysis may be, it is unlikely that buying the smallpox merely signified financial transactions. The Afro-Atlantic practice of paying the family of a child for whom variolous pus was taken an acknowledged and enslaved an enslaved child's ties to ancestry and kin and enmeshed the bodies of enslaved children within a wider social, spiritual, and geographic network. Among enslaved Africans and their descendants, cursing or insulting one's ancestors or family members was one of the greatest possible offenses. Thus, the issue that Thompson raised was not a matter of financial compensation, but rather the insistence that one acknowledge a child's place within an intergenerational social network. This was about family. An enslaved mother's demand for some small gratuity after her child's body was used for an inoculation required that the person performing the inoculation and the woman's slave owner recognize her relationship with her child. This demand refuted the basic tenets of enslavement, what Claude Mayasu and Orlando Patterson have theorized as anti-kinship and natal alienation, which Jennifer Morgan explains rendered children, quote, alienable from adults, unprotected by kinship and vulnerable to loss. Thus it seems that the great offense was not merely a matter of financial compensation, but rather one of respect for a child's place within an intergenerational familial network. A mother's demand for some small gratuity or a family's demand for payment signified a claim on their children and a theory of embodied kinship that existed and persisted despite the aggregate assault on black families that enslavers and colonists sought to enact. These financial exchanges were based on a principle that opposed the core of, heter of hereditary slavery, the refusal to acknowledge enslaved Africans' ties to ascending and descending generations. In other words, this brief passage from Thompson illustrates how enslaved people's kinship strategies persisted in the spheres of colonial medicine and public health, despite their enslavers' aggregate efforts to materialize natal alienation and anti-kinship. In conclusion, in conclusion, this map of smallpox outbreaks shows 
that in the early modern period, especially the 18th century, numerous smallpox outbreaks occurred along the routes of the slave trade. The popularization of smallpox inoculation throughout the Atlantic world was driven in part by these conditions, as well as the spread and circulation of West African and Eastern knowledge about smallpox inoculation. By the era of the American Revolution, smallpox inoculation had thoroughly transformed in the minds of enslaved Africans who used it in their homelands to preserve kin and community into a practice that their enslavers used to hold them in bondage and profit from their bodies. Enslaved people's efforts to continue the practice among themselves and renegotiate how it was practiced among their enslavers evidence their efforts to continue to imbue inoculation with social meaning. Nevertheless, the transformation of inoculation from a kin-making practice into a tool to abet enslavement defined the medical dimensions of the transition from African freedom to American slavery. This transformation would have an indelible impact on enslaved Africans and their descendants' access to healthcare through the revolutionary period and beyond. Thank you all so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. That was fantastic. Um, we can open it up to the uh, to the floor here. If anyone has questions, I think to to start us off, maybe um, you. What was the process of moving ultimately to acceptance? So you talk about you just have the brief snippet there during the revolution of Washington's army and inoculation. Um, and certainly, we know from the Cotton Mather source, there's a this great pushback against knowledge coming from Africans that obviously proves to be correct, but can you talk about that process and, and did that differ in different locations? Yes, so that process differed dramatically in different locations. By the 1720s, as folks in Boston were debating the efficacy and safety of inoculation or whether it was worth pursuing um, because it did involve deliberately spreading smallpox, as that was happening in places like St. Kitts and Barbados, there were slave owners who were already seeking mass inoculations for their enslaved people. Um, I think that because of the prevalence of smallpox in Caribbean locales in particular, that led to a, a slightly quicker um, uptake of the practice, um, especially by the 1760s and 1770s when after John Quire publishes his letters and as his letters and essays on smallpox inoculation and publicizes his inoculation experiments, which many historians have agreed were extremely exploitative. He inoculated enslaved people who were already ill and ailing and many pregnant and elderly enslaved people too, which went against what Europeans were saying you should do if you're going to practice inoculation. But by the time that he publishes, numerous phys leading physicians, like um, for instance, the chief physician in Grau Pará in Brazil, among others throughout the French Caribbean, begin taking up the practice and, and, using it, and using it more widely. There was some debate and pushback. There were some people who were fearful of it and enslaved people were fearful of it. There, I have examples where soldiers refused to get inoculated until enslaved Africans um, are successfully inoculated. So basically that's where the issue of testing comes in, in terms of performing inoculation demonstrations on enslaved people to prove to folks in throughout the Caribbean and along the Caribbean coast that um, inoculation was safe and effective. So a lot of times it was sort of these hands-on tests that convinced people um, to, to take it up. Although I would also say that the widespread use of it on plantations was often cited as an example for why um, Europeans should take up the practice and not only use it on uh, enslaved people in other places, but also use it on themselves and their own families too, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you have some information about whether they were these, these plantation owners were using it on their own families in the Caribbean rather than back in Europe, or if these West, West African factors were using it on themselves since they were living in that community? Yeah, so I'm not sure whether or not any West African factors or surgeons were using it on themselves. Um, by the 18th century, it was rare that for people to make it to adulthood without having had smallpox, especially working under the conditions that surgeons, that surgeons were working under. However, in terms, of enslaved, in terms of slave owners using it on their own families, yes, I have evidence of that. And I also have, there's one source that I didn't get a chance to discuss today about an enslaved African 
an inoculator in Saint-Domingue who performed inoculations on I think six or seven children, one of whom the, um, the author writing about this, Charles Arthaud, refers to as a dom and does not explain what her ancestry was or anything. So it's unclear to me whether or not there may have been in white and black children inoculated together in that instance by an African inoculator. In other instances, I, there's one Scottish physician who has very good records from Jamaica who inoculated black and white children together frequently um, enslaved and free, and also inocul and also often inoculated freed people of color who were members of fa of white families. Whenever he would go to inoculate those children as well, so this was something that um, that Europeans were willing to use on their own families as well as on enslaved Africans. But oftentimes, in areas where people were reticent to have inoculations performed, they insisted that they first be performed on the poor and on enslaved Africans. So thank you so much for your talk. I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more. You know, I thought that something that really interested me um, listening to you uh, was when you talked about the cultural, political meanings of inoculation in West Africa. And I was wondering um, if you see relations between the practice of inoculation and um, spiritual practices or spiritual concepts of health and disease. And so how does inoculation enter or relates to these concepts of health, disease, and their relationship with um, West African spiritual practices? Yeah. So I wish that I had like a source from the 18th or 19th century that just spelled it out for me. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find that kind of a source. Instead, I've relied a lot on anthropological literature, some of which is modern, which, is pro which has its problems for a historian of the early modern period. Um, but, you know, they, by the 19th century at least, we have examples from different European travelers who've written about um, West African concepts of smallpox being attached to deities that were known as a class of kings of the earth or um, like rulers of the land. And basically, these deities could visit or remove smallpox from a community depending on their relationship with that community or with individuals within that community. And so for some West Africans, mediating with those deities was seen as a way to address smallpox. And inoculators were often priests of those deities as well. Um, and that's where the questions around, that's where some of my questions and speculations around these financial transactions come in because it was common to pay tribute to spiritual, to spiritual medical practitioners um, or pay tribute directly to the deities. So it's unclear to me when you're talking, when I find these sources that are talking about gratuities and financial exchange, were these financial exchanges necessarily even being kept or were they going towards some other type of ritual practice? as well, but it's not its not 100% clear from the sources. Um, and I think that, I mean, there are some sources from Puritans that, I know I removed that part from the lecture, but I, I talk about it a little bit in, in a forthcoming article version of this lecture. There are some European sources that talk about enslaved Africans who say that they received the knowledge about inoculation from God himself. And these are often religious practitioners, Puritan ministers and, and folks of that sort, but I don't necessarily, and historians have tended to dismiss that as their puritanical vision of, of what God is. But I kind of want to push back against that a little bit and say, what if they did say that this was a practice that came from a God that they believed in? Um, and, and then what do we make of that spiritual connection, potential spiritual connection um, to the practice? Um, but in terms of like having a, per a perfect source that sort of spells all of that out, I, I don't have that. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm curious, a lot of your sources are coming from white Europeans and um, people living in the Americas at this time. Obviously there is a huge gap and a huge archival silence of these black enslaved voices. Were you able to find any of um, some of these voices of people that went through this inoculation experience during your research? Um, and if so, where were you able to find those sources? The closest that I have 
to a source from an enslaved African are like these heavily mediated sources like the one from Benjamin Coleman where it's an enslaved African man describing the practice or the ones from Cotton Mather. Um, I, I'm trying to think, did I have any others that were hmm, more specific? There are a couple of Middle Passage narratives um, that mention smallpox outbreaks on slave ships, but they don't provide any description of smallpox inoculation. So I don't have those kinds of rich sources that, that one would hope for. Um, and also, oftentimes, it seems like when enslaved people do bring up smallpox inoculation in narratives of their own, or, or I mean bring up smallpox at all in narratives of their own, they don't really want to talk about it extensively. I imagine that it was incredibly traumatic. I mean, this is a, this is a violent disease. You know, we, we are all now a bit familiar with monkeypox and how terrible that can be as a physical experience, how terrible that can look, and how awful it can be to witness someone going through that kind of suffering. Smallpox in the 18th century was probably like 100 times worse than that. So I think part of the reason why I don't have the sources is because of the gaps in the archive and because the archive is Eurocentric. But part of it, I think, is also that this is just something that's so traumatic that enslaved people often glossed over it. And given that many of the sources that we do have from enslaved people are either, um, in the case of the British, oftentimes narratives written by enslaved people who were free that focus on their pursuit of freedom and personal development, or if we have Iberian sources, they tend to be inquisition records. So those are enslaved people who are in trouble for different spiritual practices and things like that. Smallpox inoculation surprisingly does not show up in inquisition sources. I've, I've looked at them myself. I've asked numerous historians about this. And part of the reason I suspect it doesn't show up is because it's not something that you would necessarily want to get somebody in trouble for if it worked. Um, so we don't we don't really see that many sources directly from enslaved Africans themselves. And for the period that I study, it's far too early for, um, it's far too early for there to be really surviving oral traditions or things like the WPA narratives being useful. That said, there are, there are some accounts from the American Revolution that I know of from enslaved people who suffered from smallpox and they talk a little bit about their experiences suffering from smallpox or the prevalence of smallpox during the American Revolutionary War. Um, yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your digital mapping on the final slide of your presentation. I was really struck by the sort of movement of the epidemics over time. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the methodology that you use to craft that uh, interactive and the sort of data gathering process that went into that. Sure. So um, when I first began this dissertation project, I went, one of the places, the first places that I did research was um, the Archivo General de Indias in Seville. And I sat down with the archivist and I said, you know, I want to learn about um, smallpox epidemics that affected enslaved people. And he said, well, there's tons of sources, but they're not cataloged according to smallpox. So it would be useful if you had some type of timeline or, or guesswork in order in order to be able to go into the archive knowing where you might look, like what year an epidemic might have happened or things like that. So I went back and spent about a year in secondary sources just reading for evidence of smallpox outbreaks and created a database of outbreaks, um, which was referenced in my intro a little bit, um, that was sort of something to just go on. And as I started filling in the database, I would go back to archival sources, sometimes following other people's footnotes. Sometimes people's footnotes weren't that great, so I'd just have to pull an entire um, dossier and read through it to see where or when did smallpox happen. Um, and as I began to fill in the database, I, start, I decided, well, this is geographic data. I can map this. And once I mapped it, I started to see regional connections that were really um, instructive for guessing where other outbreaks might have occurred. So for example, if an outbreak happened in Barbados, it's likely that there was also, let's say an outbreak happened in Barbados in the 1730s, it's likely that there was also an outbreak somewhere in Venezuela and also an outbreak somewhere in South Carolina around that time, which is true. There were ones during 1738 all along that route. Same thing for St. Kitts, which was very much in that same sort of tra slave trading web. And I sort of started to get, try to be a little bit predictive about that and go into the archival sources and add and look up those years. Oftentimes find, I was correct and found more smallpox outbreaks, put them into the database and kept going. And 
about two years ago, the database was 300 outbreaks. It's now, and that map is of about 300 outbreaks. It's now over 550 outbreaks um, across the British, Spanish, Portuguese, and French empires including their slave trades, a little bit of Dutch and Danish, but not as much because I'm not as familiar in those sources. Um, and I decided to map it using CartoDB and a time-lapse map because I frequently got questions from medical historians and also historians of the early Americas who work, in who work heavily in printed sources as to whether or not smallpox was a big deal um, in the early modern period because it doesn't show up in printed sources as much as it does in manuscript records, which is what most of my research used, even though this presentation was based heavily on printed sources. Um, so I decided it was sort of a quick way of showing people, look, smallpox was a huge deal in the early modern period, and we can see it if we look at this like sort of one minute time lapse map um, that way. But it was also, but it's also been a really important research tool for me in terms of guiding my archival research as well. Well, I think that's a great point to, to end on here. I mean, this is a fantastic lecture, but your sources there and that mapping was was really incredible and I think is, you know, I think will serve many, many people too. So well, well done on putting that together. Um, thank you all for coming out um, tonight. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, again, these lectures will continue to live on online, so uh, feel free to check them out. Uh, spread the word um, on behalf of the Paul Revere Memorial Association Big thank you to the Lowell Institute for our funding, uh, GBH, of course, uh, Suffolk University History Department. And uh, if you'll join me one final time in thanking Dr. Mitchell. Thank you all.